the rules lawyer here going to talk about Guns and Gears, the new rulebook that will be released for Pathfinder 2nd Edition on October 13th. I got a hold of a PDF being a subscriber in advance of the street date, and I'll be talking in some detail about what I've seen so far and my initial impressions. This is the first rulebook since Secrets of Magic, giving player options and more toys for game masters to work with. And the theme of this book is clockwork technology, or steampunk, and firearms. And everything, nearly everything, in this book is tagged uncommon or rare, so the game master has discretion on what to allow in their game. It includes two new classes, the inventor and the gunslinger. I will not do detailed class shopping guides on them yet, this being before the street date, but I will talk about the main changes that they have seen since the playtest, and I'll give an overview of the other parts of the book. The book also includes over a dozen archetypes that I'm going to go over as well. As for what I think of the book, the TLDR is that it looks like it's the same excellence that we've come to expect from Paizo. The book has three mini books inside it. First, uh, focusing on gears, so the technology in the world with the inventor class and clockwork and steampunk equipment. Then there's guns, which includes the gunslinger and a section on firearms. And then the rotating gear, which is a section on lore. The first thing to go over is a new rare ancestry called the automaton, which is a magical construct that is living that came from an ancient fallen civilization. And what's interesting about them is that they have feats that include an enhancement entry that becomes more powerful if they take a higher level ancestry feat that enhances the previous feat. Once you gain that higher level feat, you can spend time to reconfigure your enhancements. So changing your abilities using downtime, and that's a really cool idea. We now have the final version of the Inventor class, which it has the main shtick of having an innovation that is either a suit of armor, a construct companion, or a weapon that is particularly powerful and which you can add abilities to as you start your adventuring career and as you level up. And of course, in the final version, we have more options for customizing these innovations than we did during the play test. Also, the unstable trait has been altered. The unstable trait in the play test allowed you to do something particularly powerful, but you were, if you were to try it a second time in a combat, there was a 20% chance only that you would succeed in doing so. Now, what's changed is that you now make that roll immediately when you do it the first time. So you know immediately whether you're going to be wasting your time trying it again, which is a nice boost. Also, many abilities that were unstable before now have a stable version that you can do that is weaker, such as Megavolt, which does less damage, versus the unstable version. Also, Construct Companions uh, do not... D become destroyed when they are damaged at zero hit points. They gain the dying value just like living creatures, and they can be stabilized using your craft skill to administer first aid. And they only get destroyed if they gain the dying condition twice within 10 minutes. And so you don't want to heal them back up unless it's a real emergency because then they're at risk of being destroyed. Other changes are that you gain the shield block general feat at first level. Your overdrive ability now scales up as you level up, giving you more extra damage and your construct companion more extra damage as you level up if you have one. And some class features are gained slightly earlier. So onto the rules options in the gears part of the book. First, gadgets. They are consumable technological items. And I mentioned them first because the inventor can take a feat at level four that lets them make a number of gadgets as part of their daily preparations that last for the day, just like how snare crafters and alchemists can make snares and alchemical items for free that last the day. 
And gadgets range from a blade of armor, which let you get temporary hit points for a temporary time, to blast boots, uh, to something that's akin to an airbag that protects against falling damage, something that's similar to roller skates that let you zoom around and jump around the battlefield, and a device that lets you tape record a conversation. There's a section with rules on siege weapons with siege weapons statted out. And siege weapons require two or more people, a crew, to operate. And you spend actions to aim the weapon, to load the weapon, and to launch the weapon. And these are more powerful than, obviously, what a single character can do with their own weapon. Then there is clockwork combat gear. It's a list of new weapons that include repeating crossbows which when you load them they have a re they don't require actions to reload reloading the reload value is zero however the cartridges for these crossbows have five bolts and it takes three interact actions to reload it now most of the repeating crossbows are advanced and so only fighters and gunslingers really can operate those, and for them to be equally proficient with those as with their martial weapons, they'll have to take a level 6 feat. However, this does give a boost to crossbows, for which the action economy cost of reloading usually made it suboptimal compared to other bows. The book also provides a bunch of snares that are clockwork snares, and gives a couple of hazards that are clockwork, and also has some pages of clockwork utility gear. All of these are tagged as uncommon or rare. Uh, one example of gear is day goggles that allows ancestries that have light blindness, they're basically sunglasses, and lower the light level of everything by one. There are also mobility devices, so these are combat wheelchairs. There's a very cool rare level 16 ch chair called the storm chair, which has a magical once per hour ability that gives you flight and also can cast chain lightning, which sounds really fun. It also The book also provides a lot of vehicles, many, many vehicles that are clockwork vehicles that require 10 minutes to wind up before you can operate them for one hour or more. There also is a level one vehicle called the Clunker Junker, which goblins have invented, which has a flamethrower, which looks like a lot of fun. And I game master teens and middle schoolers, and I know they're going to want to get the Clockwork Castle, which has three floors of palatial furnishings, has spider legs to attack enemies, and also four weapon mounts on the roof. There's an archetype called the Vehicle Mechanic that at level 18 can take a feat that makes a vehicle fly. And so I just see my students wanting to have a flying Clockwork Castle. Why not? The book also includes Stasian technology, which is extremely rare technology that comes from modern day Earth, which provides electricity to power these items. Then the book includes five archetypes that pretty much any class can take. Overwatch is similar to uh, the martial class from the advanced player's guide and you are a leader on the battlefield can you need to have expert in perception and you use your awareness of what's going on to give allies actions to give allies bonuses then there's the sterling dynamo which has a prosthetic limb that can give you a powerful unarmed attack that you upgrade and also other special abilities Next is the Trapsmith archetype. You need to be able to craft snares first, but you can take this at level four, which lets you add clockwork theme abilities to your clockwork snares. Then there is the Trick Driver, someone who specializes in driving and pushing vehicles to do more than they normally can. And this interacts with the vehicle rules from the Game Mastery Guide. Next is the vehicle mechanic, which lets you improve vehicles and repair them better and give them special abilities such as flight at level 18. And for the remaining archetypes, those are under the gun section, so I'll go over those later in the video. The next section of the book is the guns mini book of the book, 
and it has its own artwork, different artwork on the, around the border, which I think is a nice touch. The Gunslinger is the class in this section, and the Gunslinger is uh, focuses on firearms and crossbows, and their proficiency with firearms and crossbows is expert at level one, which no other class gets expert in anything except for the fighter. And their proficiency with firearms and crossbows is just like in the playtest. It goes up and becomes legendary at level 13. And they also get plus one damage with all firearms, which is new from the playtest. They also have medium armor proficiency now. And also every way, which is the subclass for the gunslinger, now gives you a special reload action uh, called Slinger's Reload. And this solves the dual weapon wielding problem that we saw in the play test. You can now, in the case of one of the ways that has a melee weapon in one hand and a gun in the other, they can use their special reload action to reload their gun without needing a free hand. You can also dual wield pistols using a level one class feat and like with other marshals, you get a class feat at level one. So the reload problem from the playtest has been solved. The extra accuracy that gunslingers get with firearms is key because of how firearms work. They tend to do less damage than other weapons in Pathfinder 2E, but many of them have the fatal trait, which makes them do much, much more damage on a critical hit. And since you can get a critical hit in 2E with a roll that's 10 higher than the AC, you really want that extra accuracy. There is now a fourth way called the Vanguard, which is focused on being a tank uh, in battle, uh, which includes shoving people away from you as part of your reload. So you can be at the front of the battle. As for whether gunslingers are better gunslingers than fighters, which have the same mathematical accuracy, yes, they do, because of this reload ability, which lets them reload and do an extra action depending on their way. And they also get extra abilities that fighters cannot get with regard to firearms via their feats and their way. In case you're wondering, the multi-class archetype for gunslingers only takes your proficiency with firearms up to expert. Now the firearms themselves, there are many more firearms in the final book than there were in the playtest. The firearms either have the fatal trait or the scatter trait, if there's something like a shotgun. And the scatter trait, uh, if it hits the target, does its primary damage to the target, but also does splash damage to a radius around the target. There are also weapons with the concussive trait. Now, nearly all the firearms do piercing damage, but some of them have the concussive trait so that if a target has a resistance to piercing damage or to bludgeoning damage, it uses the smaller value. So if it resists piercing, you get to essentially treat your gun with piercing damage as having bludgeoning damage. There are other f firearms provided, including beast guns, which are very fantastical, where someone has taken body parts of magical beasts and incorporated them into firearms. They have stats of regular firearms, but also magical fundamental runes included with them, but also have some special abilities such as breath weapon. Then there are cobbled weapons made by goblins and the like, which have the cobbled trait. Even on a regular failure, they have a chance of misfiring, even if you've maintained the weapon. There are combination weapons, which both are a firearm and a melee weapon, and there are rules for those. Then there are cursed weapons and intelligent weapons. Now on to the gun's archetypes. Uh, there's the multi-class archetype, of course, for the gunslinger. There's also a class archetype for the gunslinger called Spellshot, which is almost like a fifth way that lets you do energy damage with your weapons and do some arcane archer kind of abilities with it. There also is a archetype called Beast Gunner, where you go through a ritual of bonding with a beast gun and the abilities are analogous to the Eldritch Archer in that you get some rudimentary spellcasting abilities and can do fire a shot that incorporates a magic spell in it. 
The other archetypes are the Artillerist, which interacts with the rules for siege weapons and lets you do better in leading your team and doing some of the actions yourself for siege weapons. There's the Bullet Dancer, which is for monks, that gives them a stance that lets them use firearms as part of a flurry of blows and other abilities. Then there's the Demolitionist, which lets you plant bombs and do more with the bombs that you plant. Then the Firework Technician, which get, let, lets you craft fireworks, you get several per day, that have their own defined abilities. There is the Pistol Phenom, we, which can use one-handed firearms to do amazing tricks to dazzle and distract foes to get them off balance. There's a really cool feat where they fire a shot and enemies are made to raise their hands in the air. Uh, then the next one is the Sniping Duo, which is the closest we have to 1st Edition Pathfinder's teamwork feats, where you designate somebody to be your spotter and you get to work in tandem in battle. And only one of you needs to take this archetype for it to work. The next archetype is the Unexpected Sharpshooter, and this one's a lot of fun. The idea is that you're just crazy lucky, and you're just as bewildered as your enemies are by your own luck. And it's what's unclear to me is whether it's limited to firearms, there's some language that refers to guns and other language that just says ranged weapon. So I'd like some clarification there. The last mini book is called Rotating Gear, which gives profiles, like in Mwangi Expanse, on various regions of the world and how the technology in this book appears in them. So we have profiles of Alkenstar, Absalom, Arcadia, the Shackles, Tianxia, Vudra, and Ustalav. Also, we have a profile on Dongun Hold and uncommon feats for Dongun Hold dwarves. So that's my preview of Guns and Gears. What's interesting is it said explicitly in the book that Numeria is not in this book, and for that super advanced future technology, it will be focused on in something else in the future. So I think that's a pretty clear hint that we're going to get something like this book that will deal with super technology, like the first edition's technology guide, which I know a lot of my players will be really looking forward to, and which will definitely be testing ideas for a Starfinder 2E in some indeterminate point in time. So if you enjoyed the video, please like and also subscribe. My name is Ronald. I am a lawyer who runs and teaches tabletop role-playing games with kids, and this channel is really focused on teaching and popularizing Pathfinder 2E. Check out my other videos if you haven't yet, and I will see you next time.